So, hey, who would value weakness over strength? I mean, who, who would really live this way? To sacrifice your life for others, to, uh, to, to consider yourself uh, less than other people. I mean, who would really do this? This is the paradox of the Christian life. We're going to be talking about it throughout the summer. We're looking at the book of 1 Timothy. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, go ahead and grab your Bible. You can turn there. Find your way there. I'll be setting this up for the whole series. And if you're at home, grab your Bible. Uh, we're going to be focused in on God's Word, gang. So I hope that this, throughout the summer, you're going to be walking through 1 Timothy with us, whether you're uh, you know, on vacation or out and about. We were singing just a minute ago. I'm over here just in, in tears, just praising God for how good he is and, and just thanking that song about, you know, catch me singing when the springtime comes. Just, Lord, catch me. It's been a hard year, and it's so good to be back together, uh, just praising the Lord together, and it's so good to see you. But listen, stay connected to your church family, and for all of you online, we just welcome you, and we're glad that you're here with us. We are going to take the Lord's Supper in a bit. If you want to grab your elements, we'll get to that um, as we kind of really the, the climax of our service in the end of it all. You know, King Jesus, the king of this upside-down kingdom, is the one who said, that in the kingdom of God, the weak are actually those who are strong. That those who humble themselves are actually the ones who are, who are exalted. He said the poor are the rich ones, and the last are the ones who are first. It's a paradox of a kingdom, and who would actually live this way? It's paradoxical because it seems counterintuitive. It seems self-contradictory. It's like this doesn't make sense. And yet, for those who choose, this is the challenge of the Christian life, those who choose to live that way, which is a central kind of a gospel-centered life, meaning the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus becomes our own lives. It's why we baptize the way we do. Dying to self, totally forgiven, raised up again to live for him. To be a Christian means I'm responding to what Christ has done for me. Now I'm going to live this way, this paradoxical upside down kingdom. And watch this. He says, anybody who chooses to live this way, this is the way to joy, peace, and purpose in life. Do you believe it? This is the Christian life. And this is what we're going to be talking about. Throughout the summer. Now, there's no better place. There's other places, but uh, one great book to look at is First Timothy, where we see this practice put into practice how we are to behave, and it starts first in the church. It starts in the family of God, and then it goes out. We it's like a lab. We learn how to do it together among grace centered, Jesus loving people, and those of us who are trying to learn what that looks like, and then we apply it to our lives. And so, First Timothy tells us. How to do this. We've been talking about, if you've been with us, and I know a lot of you are new, but we've been talking about the book of Acts and really getting back to church and all that kind of thing, springtime coming and, and the summer. What does it mean to be the church? Uh, we talked about the plan of the church and it's really start where you are. The purpose is to make disciples, but start right where you are. We said that the people of the church, every member is a minister. Every person is called out to serve. We said that the, the, the priority is prayer. Because the power of the church is the Holy Spirit. We said the proclamation is the gospel. It's the central message of Jesus, which is what we're all about. And I could say it this way, if you want another P, now we're going to talk about the practice. How do you live this out in community? What does this upside down kingdom look like? So in 1 Timothy, um, he actually tells us what he's writing this, uh, why he's even writing this book. And he's writing, by the way, again, to set this up, he's writing to Timothy, okay, young leader in Ephesus. This is a specific church, specific time and place, but the principles uh, we're going to apply, apply anywhere, anytime, all the time. In Acts 20, we know that Paul spent um, about three years with these people. He knows them well, so keep that in mind as we hear him saying, hey, here's what I want you to do. Tell them this, tell them this. He's going to call out certain people, and he actually, he knows who these people are, okay, he knows them well. This is about 65 AD. It's about 30 years after Pentecost, so consider that too, that the apostles' teaching has been going on for 30 years. I mean, some of you aren't 30 years old. This has been going on for some time, and right at the heart of it is, is the gospel, of the teaching of Jesus and, and his life. So in 1 Timothy 3, before we get to chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, he says this. He explains why he's writing this. Verse 14, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that, there it is, the purpose, if I delay, you may know how you ought to behave in the household of God, 
which is, and look how he describes it, which is, this is the ESV, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. It's like, okay, we are a community of truth, a place where truth is known and, and honored and obeyed. And here's what we want to do. We want to teach you how to obey his word and to behave, all right? Now, one of the main reasons he writes the book, we're going to dive right into it today, is uh, to confront false teaching. Uh, false teaching is not a new thing. It's happened from the inception of the church from the very beginning. But it's so insidious. It's so subtle. We're all exposed to it, by the way. We're going to apply this message today more than you know. Uh, but it's a mix of truth and lies. And watch this. False teaching that he's confronting is in the church, not outside the church. Now, what happens is we bring outside influences into the church, combining with right, the gospel truth. And yet, it's a mix of truth and lies that comes into the church. It's paradoxical. It's kind of like um, good poison. It's like bad medicine, not administered properly. You might know this. I was reading this week about some, some, uh, some poisons that enter into our lives unbeknownst to us often. You know that if you take certain medicines together, you know it can kill you, right? That could help you otherwise, could kill you. You may not know that bleach, which is probably somewhere in your house, maybe in, you know, you're doing laundry or whatever else, bleach mixed with ammonia, which is in cleaning products and such, can kill you. Those two things together, the fumes can kill you. Bleach being a good thing can clean, ammonia even, clean things, right? can actually, if mixed with something else, is lethal. In the same way we're going to see today is God's law, the truth of God's standard and holy living, is good for us to know and to respond to and to pursue and to seek his grace when we don't don't measure up. But you mix that with something, an outside source, uh, that can kill you. And this is the great challenge of false teaching. And it's why we need to address this. It's why he does here. And so this is why he is writing this. And what I want to talk about today is uh, the poison of falsehood, uh, the remedy of truth, the gift that is truth, and then how we, we need to read the label. I'm going to guide you on how do you identify false teaching and how to respond to it. Okay, now here's what we're going to do. Every week, we're going to read the text. We're going to be in the word, and, and I'm going to read this out loud over you. If you have your Bible, you can follow along with well, I'm, I'm the ESV if you are, but you can, I'm just going to read this over you. And I want to do this, and I'd like for you to stand right where you are, okay? So let's all stand in honor of God's word. If you're at home, you can do the same. Not too awkward. It's in honor of his word to us today. And I'm reading uh, from 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. He's already introduced himself, and he's also given Timothy this apostolic authority, kind of saying, okay, you're the man, let's go. And in verse 3, he says, as I urged you, this is a, a military command, actually. He says, I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any doctrine, any different doctrine." nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things, they, things about which they make confident assertions. Verse 8. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy And profane for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, uh, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with, or that would, which would line up with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. This is the word of God for us today. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, as we unpack this, I'm going to start with um, chapter 1, verse 3. The first thing I want you to see is the poison of falsehood, all right? The poison of falsehood. Verse 3, and I urge you, 
when I was going, now what he's saying here is, uh, and because I've already read this, I'll just unpack it as we go. Uh, he, he says, hey, I've, he's likely has already told him, given him this teaching in person. And so he's kind of saying, okay, now here's what we talked about when I urged you in Macedonia. I want you to stay in Ephesus, and I'm charging you to, to call, look at this, young, young pastor leader, call out certain people, tell them stop teaching. You, you do this, and likely, again, he might exa- know exactly who these people are. He says, these certain people, they're not outsiders, they're insiders. And he charges him, he says, tell them to stop, call them out with, look at this, a different doctrine. Okay, here's the first sign of false teaching. And I'm going to give you a, a few signs so you can take notes on this. This is so important for us. When it's a new truth, a new thing. Now, it's not that we're always learning, but there is no new gospel. There's no new truth. I'm reminded of Galatians 1, 9. You might remember, uh, if you know Galatians, Paul says, hey, if anybody comes along and preaches you something different than what we've been preaching, let them be accursed. In fact, he says, hey, you know what? Even if an angel comes, all right, and just tells you something that we have not taught you that came from Jesus himself, let them be accursed. There's no new gospel, is the thing. There's no new way to heaven. We don't know exactly what this false teaching was, but we know it had to do with legalism, it had to do with the law. So, so how about this? I could say it had to do with what they already knew. Now there's this adding to. It's a new thing. In Acts 17, 21, uh, I, I was reminded of this. It says, now the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Now think about that. We don't deal with that in our culture at all, do we? Holy smoke. The newest, the latest thing. We love to talk about new ideas. Why is that? We're not content with what we already know, what is true. We want something more. We want the latest blog. We want the latest podcast. We want the latest person. That person is legit. Wow, look at how they do this. And we want the new thing. C.S. Lewis called it chronological snobbery. We're the latest. We showed up. We're the, we must be because we came later We're smarter than all those people. I mean, this happens in generations, right? Young person, 15 years old. I'm smarter than my parents. I know all this stuff. I'm new to this. That's old. They like the old stuff. I'm into the new stuff. And this happens for everybody. We always are pursuing new things. It's like the latest word on a subject is the best word and the final word. And young people need to hear this. Lewis defined it this way. He said, the uncritical acceptance of the intellectual climate common to our own age and the assumption that whatever has gone out of date, he he says, is on that account discredited. I'm reminded of a quote from his book, The Four Loves, where he says, all that is not eternal is eternally out of date. So you got the latest, greatest thing, whatever trend, uh, it'll be gone soon, right? And so what we do, we're always looking for the new thing. Now, there's a difference between learning some new things. Okay, we can talk about this. Got to be discerning. Learning new things. But, but those things that seem new and then, then going back to the scriptures for truth. Back to the Bible and to the gospel as our definitive uh, stance on, 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 tr- on what is true. We're, we're not called to reinvent the church. Uh, in fact, our message is old and out of date, in, in Lewis's words. It's 2,000 years old, and there's no new gospel. It does not change. There's nothing new about Scripture. Now, now there may be something new, again, that we learn, but the standard of our teaching is Jesus and the gospel. So back in Acts 2, when the church just started, it said that they all devoted themselves. It's a word, proskartereo in the Greek. And it means passionately devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Um, You may know that, somewhere around uh, chapter 2, verse 41 or so, uh, through 45, describing the church. They were passionate about this. But now it says, look at this, verse 4, nor to devote, same word, passionately devoting themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations, look at these words, rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. He's saying, okay, now we're looking at what what he calls myths and endless genealogy. Now, now some of you may go, well, I'm not into myths or endless genealogy. I'm good. Let's go. Move on to the next verse. So wait, wait, wait. What is this? What is this? Well, we don't know exactly what the false teaching was. It's fantastical stories 
um, and fantasy, you know, kind of family origin or lines, family trees that digressed into silliness instead of focused on the main thing. So here's another look. False teaching is not focused and centered on the gospel, on the main thing. One of the ways you can detect false teaching is that it's guided by a current cultural moment instead of the timely, uh, timeless word of God. And this happens in spades in our day. The Ephesians were, were craving new ideas, stirred up for all these new ideas. And again, this happens on demand in our day. All you got to do is scroll through your, your social media feed or, or, or hit your favorite website, news feed. It's on demand. And we get stirred up by, watch this, going to false teachers and not to God's word. Many of us spend more time. You can look at, your, look at your phone, look at an app that tells you how much time you're on a screen or on your phone up against how much you're in God's word. Whoo! No wonder. Wouldn't you expect then that we're being discipled and spiritually formed by the stuff that we're looking at that is not God's word? False teachers come in at us instead of the Bible itself. Why are we stirred up for new things? Why do we get so stirred up? How about this? Satan is a liar. Satan is a deceiver. And all he wants to do is this massive disinformation campaign that's coming at us constantly. And so think about it. Biblical interpretation often, or how about a new thing comes often after a cultural revolution. Like, like let's say the sexual revolution of the 60s, 70s. Then all of a sudden, following that, oh, we got some new teaching. Uh, Bible mixed with, with culture. We got new teaching on human sexuality now. We, we've, we, we now we're redefining gender now, even. We're, we, we're, we're moving away from the binary you know, sexual ethic of the Bible, and now it, it follows a cultural revolution often. What can also happen, though, is what takes place in culture starts to dominate the conversations among Christians in theology or whatever else. I've seen this. I've been watching this for the past year. Or so, everybody wants to talk about critical race theory. Everybody's all about CRT. When a year ago, nobody knew anything about it, unless you're in academia, a Marxist kind of theory. People are all about it. And, and it makes me crazy because here's the thing. You know what's not new? Bigotry, racism, uh, prejudice, partiality, the oppression, of, even patriarchal oppression, of, of women uh, of, or minority. That's not new. So what we do is we look at scripture, we look at the gospel, we start there, and then we go into these places. And as Paul is going to teach us throughout the book, it's one thing to have proper doctrine and right teaching. It's another thing to come at it with love and what I call the way of Jesus. Here's something that's so helpful for me. I run into people throughout my, my, my life, you know, I'm, I'm one of them that say, I believe the word of God, it's God's authority, it's the truth, it's his word, I believe in the inerrant word of God. But we got to look at the word of God through what we call the way of Jesus, meaning Jesus is perfect theology. Jesus, so if it, if it contradicts, I'm like, wait, that doesn't seem to jive with Jesus. It's because you're not looking through the lens of Jesus all of the apostles' teaching, everything we have comes out of the life and the person of Christ. He is perfect theology because not only did he speak perfect theology, he actually embodied it. And so we look at him and say, how would he respond to this? And, and too often we're running to all kinds of, of cultural speculations. That's what he's talking about here. Instead, we're to steward, did you catch that word? We're to steward an ancient teaching. It's unchanging truth of the gospel. So there's first this poison of falsehood. It's been a lot of time there. Now I want to move to the remedy of truth. And this is where he says, hey, truth is a gift if it's given appropriately. Look at verse 5. The aim of our church is, or aim of our charge, yes, in our church, is love that issues from a pure heart. Look at these three. Pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. Our end game is love. Paul throws this in to contrast this up against the false teaching, the craziness, all this stuff that they're running after. He says, a biblical teaching rightly applies the law, okay, while non-biblical teaching uses it as a tool for abuse. This is what he's saying. How often do we think, I'm going to just speak the truth, or we're going to come after that group, or say, this is what God's word says, like I was noting earlier, instead of approaching it with the way of Jesus. 
These are two very different things. Can be. Think about this. This hit me this week. You can have right doctrine, and if you don't present that, how about the you know challenging people? If you're not doing it out of love, you are a false teacher. Both are equally important. We could run the same demonic pathway that says, I got the truth, I got the truth, I got the truth without love. And he says, that's false teaching. And we, we need to get our minds around it. The way of Jesus is what guides us in all that we do and say. And the aim is love. Jesus embodies it. And he says, hey, I want you to see in verse 6, certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussions. These, what are these? Love, pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. This is a good moment to ask. If you're a, if you're a connect group leader, if you're leading a Bible study, um, or whatever you're allowing into your mind, maybe you're being discipled by your screen, or, you know, or an app, or your, your devotional, whatever it is, are you focused on the main thing? Or are we going off on all kinds of non-core issues that don't matter? We can spend all of our time talking about those things that don't matter and, and veer away from, move away from the gospel. And, and when I say the gospel, a lot of us think, oh yeah, okay, Jesus is death, uh, burial, resurrection. Yes. But look, this personifies the Christian life. It's the gospel drenched life is one that says, I've died to myself and I'm doing every, I'm dying again right now in this relationship. I, I'm dying to myself and my needs and I'm, gonna, and I'm raised up, the spirit of God in me to live this new life before my spouse, before my friends or my team or at work or in the neighborhood. I'm going to live a new life now empowered by the spirit because Christ is raised up in me, his spirit in me. I'm going to live for him now. Self-sacrifice, even enemy love. I'm going to live a life that looks like Jesus. That's what the gospel-centered life looks like. And he's saying here, get focus, stay focused on the main thing. I have people through the years who who said, um, Pastor, I just want to go deeper in the word. You know, I don't know why they always talk that way, but you know, they would go deeper in the word. I don't know where I came up with that, but they, I want to go deeper in the word. And and what they mean is. And I get it, because I'm all about it. I want to get into the Hebrew and the Greek, kind of more on the, the history of that passage. I love the exegesis of that passage. I'm going to get into the... Let's get. And you're like, okay, context and all that matters. That's why you have those who study it and can preach it and teach it. But, but no, no, no. The focus is the gospel. And what Jesus has accomplished for us, don't get running off to all these things that don't matter. Because it's the gospel, dying to self, a raised up life. And grace uh, in all things that changes. Go deeper with that. This is always my challenge. Scrutinize the gospel. Get underneath the gospel. Unpack the gospel. I mean, last week, Grant Glover, I told him later, he had a gospel-centered message throughout because he was talking about how the gospel is applied in what he was teaching and, and out of the Old Testament. I mean, it's, it's central to everything that we do when we talk about it. Look at verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law. Uh-oh desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what, they, what they're saying and then they're super confident about what they're talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. And they're confident. Watch this. Another sign. Two things here. Another sign of false teaching. They desire a platform. People who want to be raised up and desire a platform. James 3.1, you might know, says, Not many of you should become teachers because you know that we who teach will be under stricter judgment. I mean, I live with this all of the time. I will answer before God Almighty someday for, for my teaching and preaching and, yes, my life not to be a false teacher Bringing to you what I am unwilling to do and live out myself. And I'm not a perfect man. I'm a fallen man leaning on its grace. But more, what, what happens is we see people nowadays, again, everybody's got a platform. Be careful. Anybody's got a phone has a platform. And they were not raised up necessarily by spiritual authority and leaders over them. The people who are raised up into places of authority within the church, like Timothy, are people who had spiritual authority over them, who saw gifts and saw a calling on their life and raised them up. And we see that in the body, the local church. What happens now is, bam, give me a phone. I have a platform. Let me tell you what you ought to believe. Be careful, friends, because those who are false teachers bypass the spiritual authority and instruction of folks over them 
and seek a platform without that kind of blessing. And we see it all the time nowadays. And I want you to be aware and be watching for it. Now, watch this. He says, they desire to be in front of people, and worse, they don't know what they're talking about, and they do it with great confidence. Just because somebody looks slick and looks like they know what they're talking about doesn't mean that they are a, a teacher of, of God and, and of the word. Beware of anyone, how about this, who is certain all the time about what they're saying. They're confident. They're boisterous. They're loud. They're dominating the moment. They want to be the, the alpha male or female, whatever that might be. And beware of people like that because you, what we see is people who are like that, oftentimes we call that leadership, not in the kingdom of God. It's an upside down kingdom. People who God uses are people who are humble, who are servants, seeking to raise up others. And so we see the poison of falsehood. The remedy is, of, is the gospel, is love. And then now I'm going to close with this. Read the label. All right? So there's a difference between pharmaceutical medicines that are in your cabinet all right? and reading the label and taking it monitored, labeled, and, and uh, all the instructions, and then just drugs that you take without control. Without, without any restraint. How do we use the truth that we have not to become false teachers ourselves? In verse 8, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. The law, this is again, this is a way of talking about God's holy standard, which is good for us. Let's us know how we are to live. But if it becomes something that's oppressive and hurtful towards other people, destructive, then that's false teaching. Is, is what he's saying. It's like a scalpel as a knife. It's like nuclear power used as a bomb. It, again, it's like medicine that's used as poison. We do the same when we use the Bible to beat other people down and just use truth to just condemn people. You know, we've talked about it before. You've heard the saying probably, you know, we're to love the sinner um, but, but hate the sin, you know. No, no, no. Hate your own sin. Love all people. Look first at the log in your own eyes, Jesus said, and not the speck in the other. Or we become false teachers. And so look at verse 9. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, and for the unholy and profane. He's just laying out all of this. He's saying, hey, it's obvious there needs to be a, a, a law code of holiness but it's not primarily for people who've been rescued by grace and seeking to live responsible lives. It's for people who are living irresponsibly to focus in on their sin. The law shows us where we fall short. He goes, he goes on. For those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. He's just naming all these things. And he says it's not aligned with here. He's back to it. The gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. He says the truth needs to be administered, inoculated, given to all with grace, or you become a false teacher. Now, i got to say this parenthetically. He mentions those who practice homosexuality. Now, the LGBTQ community has been one group within our culture that Christians have come after with truth, with truth, with truth, and not a whole lot of love. And this love has to take place in the context of a relationship. It's always that way. Where we actually, we're not objectifying any group of people, but instead we're loving them and we're seeking to love them to Jesus. So how do we confront it? And I mean in false teaching. How do we confront it to close with this? How do we not become those who use it to just tear down and again enter into the equally demonic practice of attacking people, ripping them up with the Bible. In a word, you've heard it, is love. And it's in the context of relationship. In fact, those who are false teachers are not even enemies. They're often deceived themselves, right? And so look at verse 5 again. This is the cent central piece here, the aim, the goal. It is this command. It is love. And notice here's three things here. He, 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 I want to highlight the pure, pure heart. The, the pure in heart will see God and know how to live and how to talk with people. Good conscience. This is a, the ability to wisely and objectively discern what is right and what's wrong. Then sincere faith. 
You can imagine, sincere faith, we actually live out what we believe. And we're seeking not to find the speck in someone else's eye, but to get the log out of our own and confront the truth in our own lives. And we lovingly then can confront truth in the lives of others, mostly by our lives. And yes, what we say. But we confront false teaching by knowing and sharing the real thing. That's what Paul's getting at here. And here, even in verse 5, we have a portrait of Jesus. We have a portrait of the one who is the perfect teacher because he embodies all that he says. He is true. He is the truth. He is the way. He's life. And so fix your eyes on him and set our hearts on him. And what we thought would be really cool is to close our time by sharing the Lord's Supper. There's no greater moment for a church family to focus in on the gospel than the Lord's Supper. And so we're going to sing together as we close. We're going to sing a song. And then we're going to come into the middle of it and take the Lord's Supper together. And then uh, we're going to finish out this song. The song itself is really a declaration of the gospel and what we believe. So we want this ringing in your head as you go into the week. Let me pray for us and the team's going to lead us. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for reminding us with all the craziness that comes into our minds and all that we're seeing and, and, and people that are coming at us with, with, with the truth mixed with lies. That we can focus on you, the main thing. And friend, if you're here and you've never received Christ, today is your day. There's only one way, and it's Jesus giving your life right now. Just say, Lord, come into my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I believe. I believe that you have died on the cross for me, live the perfect life as my substitute, and now I can have a new life in you. I give you my life. I lay down my life before you. I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, now as we proclaim together, you said until you're coming again, until we come to the marriage supper of the Lamb, we will proclaim together what you've done for us. We believe. We proclaim it now in Jesus' name.